I'm excited to welcome our next guest. They are the co-authors of Palestine, A Socialist Introduction, Sumaya Wad and Brian Bean. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. So this, uh, you know, this is obviously a topic that many in the left feel very strongly about, and I think it does tie into our conversation of the day around your Tandon, very much so, uh, which we'll get to later. But um, is it, does it just go without saying that, say, most socialists do carry the same stance on Palestine, or is this, is this something about much bigger? Like, what was the inspiration behind your book? Whoever wants to chime in, go ahead. Thanks, and, and thanks again for having us here. Um, I think it's true that that many socialists in the U.S. at least do uh, support Palestinian liberation. I think the definition of what Palestinian liberation means is very different for different people, and I think that's very much a thing in this new socialist left that's emerging in the U.S. Um, but uh, we're still a long way from getting to the point that, that we need to be at, which is full support for the boycott, divestment, sanctions movement, full support for what Palestinians are calling for on the ground, whether that's in Gaza, Palestinian citizens of Israel, Palestinians in the West Bank or in the global diaspora. And that's where this book comes in. Um, so it's a book that's trying to put forward arguments to help people understand the link between the struggle for freedom here in the US to this larger international fight um, for liberation. And I think there's a lot of ways that people can draw from the Palestinian freedom struggle, sort of a roadmap to grasping exactly how the various movements that exist here in the US, right from immigration, gender justice, um, the fight against climate change, how they intersect and interlock to um, imperialism and US imperialism in particular in the Middle East. And I think Palestine is one important focal point of that. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's sort of what the book aims to do. I think to put it very bluntly, it's trying to get um, Palestinians to uh, to be a part of this emerging socialist uh, left in the U.S. and then bringing uh, socialism to to Palestinian liberation. When you say bringing Palest uh, bringing Palestinians part of this socialist movement, you mean uh, the diaspora in the U.S., the Palestinians who are located in the United States, or do you mean abroad as well or anywhere, frankly? Brian, do you want to take that? Uh, why don't you take this one? Cool. Um, I mean, definitely in the U.S., our main audience is a U.S. audience, right? We're trying to educate people and raise awareness here about how these struggles connect. And so I think there's there's a lot to say for the Palestinian diaspora and the movement that's growing here in the U.S. that's existed for long, but that's now really radicalizing around other uh, struggles from the struggle against racism to uh, anti-imperialist feminism, et cetera. So I think it's bringing that particular audience um, and drawing on the, the very uh, long and, and, and rich history of uh, socialism in the Middle East and in Palestine um, and various uh, left uh, and communist parties um, in Palestine in particular. So bringing up that tradition, connecting it to what we're seeing today. Go ahead, Ryan. If I could add something to that, I think that in addition to that, you know, there is um, the notion that socialists are all about fighting imperialism. Like that's something that you often hear. Like it's like, that's what socialists do. They build movements against imperialism and whatnot. So I think when we're talking about sort of connecting struggles, I think that one of the things we wanna bring into the discussion about building a socialist movement against imperialism is that Palestine is central in that. I mean, Palestine is central because the Israeli state is a central feature in US imperialism and world domination. And so if we're gonna build a movement to combat US imperialism, uh, fighting for the liberation of Palestine has to figure in that centrally. And so I think, so that's part of the argument they're making as well too. If you, you know, are you're socialist and you wanna combat imperialism, you gotta take on Palestine, you gotta take on Israel. Similarly, if you're fighting for the liberation of Palestine, you're gonna come up against the question of US imperialism. So what I find really interesting about this is, um, you know, in the 90s and 2000s, um, the Democrats uh, cozied up to Netanyahu, obviously, and they still do, by the way. It's just he's now a little bit more toxic of a figure because of his relationship with Trump. Because of his relationship with Trump and just how, especially in the last week, the turn of events that have happened, um, you know, in, in response to Iran, et cetera, why... <laughs> Do you think that this movement is 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 becoming a little bit more mainstream? Like, do you do you find that there are more, uh, for lack of a better word, like normie Dems who 
have a little bit more sensitivity and understanding um, of the complexities in the Mideast? I mean, it, it, are they warming up to, to this, for lack of a better term, like the socialist argument uh, for the liberation of Palestine? Do you find that like there's a crossover appeal because Netanyahu's just so outrageous? I think there's two features of this. I think like how just bad and egregious Netanyahu has been, has been something that has, I think, um, been part of a sea change in American politics in which the question of Israel and Palestine used to be basically a third rail, you know, like it's something that you sort of couldn't touch. And now it's something that is openly debated in Congress and is seen more and more and more as kind of an issue of progressives. So not even sort of beyond sort of the socialist milieu, but sort of considered progressives. And so I think that, you know, Netanyahu's actions, him being associated with Trump, his flirtations with various sort of far right forces have, have been a part of that. But I think the other part of that is the BDS movement. And so I think that sort of even before that, there was a lot of organizing on the ground, um, mostly in college campuses in the United States, but sort of tirelessly sort of fighting to kind of delegitimize the notion of of Israel as somehow the the greatest democracy in the Middle East or some nonsense like that. And so I think that that, that Netanyahu's um, egregiousness and sort of um, uh, escalating the aggression is part of it. I think that the BDS movement that existed before that and is still ongoing is also essential for that sea change in politics that I think you talked about. How much has the BDS movement shifted? Uh, I mean, do are there like elected officials who are, are running as progressives in terms of supporting the BDS that's because I, I bring this up because, you know, in the, in the 90s, or maybe it was even in the 80s, in the Democratic Party, for instance, this idea was recognizing Palestine, <laughs> just, just their simple recognition <laughs> was the most controversial take that the DNC as an institution uh, had. And, and it ostracized people like uh, Dr. Zogby, who was the person who introduced that and ran under the Jesse Jackson Rainbow Coalition, um, and, and as well as BDS. And... Uh, like you said, a third, it became a third rail in the, the party itself so that other lawmakers didn't want to be associated with that because they didn't want to feel the same ostracizing um, that, that that was happening. Uh, how How is it, do we see, I mean, I, I know these are often, this question is brought up on questionnaires, especially if people are looking for a DSA support, but other other organizations too. Do we find that there's a, a movement from candidates and elected officials too? Whoever wants to respond. Definitely. Um, there's there's definitely a shift. Um, I mean, you're seeing today people running and uh, and like openly supporting the right to boycott. Um, you had Cori Bush do that yeah. in, yeah. in Missouri. And this was days before her primary. Right. So like this was prime time to completely avoid the question of Palestine and certainly BDS. And instead, she chose to to uh, respond to it. Uh, you have elected officials like Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib. Uh, who openly support the right to boycott. Um, and then on local levels, someone like Zuhran Mamdani, who just ran in, in Queens and won um, for assemblyman. And he openly supports the boycott of and, and sanctions movement, not just the right to boycott, but the movement itself as a tactic uh, for liberation. And I think I think that's enormous and that's tremendous. And I think one of the one of the ways we can show that there's this shift and that uh, there's real progress on this front is um, all the laws that are coming out to boycott and to attempt to criminalize and punish those who advocate for Palestinian liberation and specifically those who use the the BDS um, tactics. And and really quickly, just to you know piggyback on something Brian said earlier about Netanyahu, your question about Netanyahu, I think that's entirely true um, that he's helped sort of push this progressive front because of his alliance with Trump. But I also think what we're seeing is that there are people, both elected officials and then on the ground, uh, who recognize that it's not just Net Netanyahu didn't start right this this uh, this right wing movement in Israel, but it's actually the the very nature of, of Israel is inseparable from that of imperialism, settler colonialism, and so its existence as it currently stands needs to change. Right, it's an ethno state. It's inherently incompatible with justice, and that's what we're fighting against. Um, and that's part of what the book is trying to put forward: that it's not just about Netanyahu, it's not just about Trump, it's not just about these last ten years. It's actually a much longer history, and, and there's a much longer fight ahead of us. Can Can we talk about some of the solidarity? I mean, when when you say solidarity uh, with Palestine as as a as a, a colonized state at this point, probably I don't know. Is that fair enough to say? Um, what I, I, you said something about environment, and I that really stuck to me because there is this intersectional um, 
aspect that's not like discussed, you know, first off, it's just never discussed in the mainstream, but, but never from like an intersectional approach. And I remember I was talking to Linda Sarsour at one point about um, water and I was really blown away by <laughs> the lack of clean water and kind of the games that are being played by uh, Israel and controlling the water supply with the people of Palestine. Can we just like touch on that and some of the environmental aspects? Because th that was really eye opening to me. Whoever, uh, Brian, you just went off mute first. I'll say you first. <laughs> <laughs> good, good eye. It's like Jeopardy. Go. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, what is water for 500 and Mickey? Um, yeah, I think that this issue, aside from just being an environmental question, so the, the access to water and how that has been diminished, particularly in the West Bank and, of course, in, in Gaza, um, and the way in which the pattern of settlements is uh, pushed into places that makes it even uh, harder to access the water. And, you know, that's an environmental question. I think the other thing, you started talking about solidarity. And so there's, this, there's a solidarity question about environmental justice. I think there's also many parallels around the question of racism. So, you know, there's also Flint, Michigan, where they still don't have water and it's next to a lake and it's poisoned. And so these patterns of, of connections and solidarity with environmental justice, but also questions of racism, I think are different threads that we need to sort of pull on to indicate how our struggles are indeed connected and by fighting together is how we can uh, transform them. Samaya, do you have any thoughts to piggyback? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you really can't talk about climate change without talking about imperialism. Um, they just come hand in hand. And I think there are so many examples from around the globe um, that, that attest to that. Um, in Palestine in particular, there are so many ways that Israel's apartheid regime really, uh, 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 sorry, uh, there's so many ways that Israel's apartheid regime just passes all these laws and policies uh, that completely destroy the Palestinian, um, Palestinian land, um, uh, among many other things. And I think with water in particular, the figures are just really, really staggering. So in, in the West Bank and the occupied West Bank, Palestinians live on an average of about 70 liters of water per capita per day. Um, meanwhile, Israeli settlers in these Jewish only settlements that Palestinians are completely prohibited, prohibited from entering, um, consume up to 300 liters of of, of water per capita per day. So, I mean, the, the difference is just, how can you look at that and think this is not apartheid? How can you look at that and think this is not settler colonialism? Um, you know, the, the, the numbers don't lie, they're right there. And this is just one example. I think the same applies with how um, Israel, you know, goes into Palestinian farms and just raises hundreds of olive trees down um, and then points the finger at Palestinians and say, oh, it's your fault, you're not taking care of them or it's weak infrastructure. Um, and, and I think the list goes, goes on and on. Uh, let's touch on some of the other uh, things that you bring up in the final minutes uh, about your book. So, so um, if we were to pick three issues, just because the book, you can read the book, pick up the book, put it up on screen, everybody can take a look at it. The three issues that would probably uh, surprise people the most in terms of um, key aspects of international solidarity, you know, whether it's climate or gender justice or, or I mean, what would you say the top line issues? Like if, if we're going to go to our, our holiday dinners with our families and we want to educate them. These are the three uh, intro points for them. Um, great question. I mean, I think the the most egregious one is just on the the funding. Um, you know, the U.S. state gives one hundred thirty eight billion uh, ish in twenty nineteen. Um, you know, money to the Israeli state, which is a settler colonial racist ethno state, and that amount of money is a lot of money that um, could be spent on a lot of things that people sitting around the dinner table at the holidays will want. You know, there's the popularity of Medicare for all. Um, here in Chicago, we're talking about um, mental health care. Like there's all these things that we need. Um, the economy, of course, is still in a recession. Um, and rather than spending it on these things, it's spent on a settler colonial state. I think that- And, and where does the money go to? I mean, is it allocated specifically? Um, I mean, a lot of it still goes to, to military spending, um, still does. Um, and so I think that, that that would be sort of the first uh, bit that I would sort of talk about. I mean, 100, you know, the, the, the budget of the state of Illinois is like 46 billion. So I think just making the comparison about how much is, how much is spent um, uh, based on what we spend here is just the most egregious thing. Um, just, I think, what, one quick follow up to that. Yeah. Comparatively to, to the Obama administration, did that budget get much larger? How, what's your sense? Oh, Obama mean, passed it? that. Yeah. Sorry, it go ahead. It was beyond $138 billion per year? 
So, so the number is $38 billion I'm sorry. Dollars, um, over, the, over a 10-year period. That's what Obama passed right before he left office. So it's $3.8 billion per year. Um, which is a lot of money um, and, you know, could fund so many things that we need right now, especially as we we suffer through this uh, second wave of COVID. You know, you have 40, uh, sorry, I think I, I read this morning in the New York Times, it was like one person is dying of COVID every 40 seconds in the United States right now. And if you think about $3.8 billion, um, that's all specifically military funding for Israel. And they actually have to use a certain percentage of that to buy weapons from the U.S. So this is also fueling the U.S. weapons industry at the same time. And we know what that means. It means our police are getting militarized here. Um, that I mean, that that directly comes back back here it's to hurt us. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and so I, I definitely agree with Brian about that being being the first one. Um, and I would, I'll, I'll give the second and then and then Brian, you could do the third. Um, I think the second the second one would be um, like settler colonialism and like the fight, the indigenous people's fights here in the U.S. I think that certainly was brought to the to the mainstream during the Standing Rock protests in um, in 2016. Um, so I think that's another big theme, talking about how uh, indigenous struggles are ongoing. This is not something in the past. It's not like a historic thing we can just study in a textbook, but it's actually ongoing right now. And we have a role to play in stopping it. And you really, you can't separate these indigenous struggles from climate change, right? Because they're all about land and the environment. And um, this past year, we, we saw what happened in California with the fires um, and in Washington and, and, and Oregon. So I think connecting it to indigenous struggles and, and, and really understanding how from Turtle Island here in the U.S. to to Palestine, that these are ongoing struggles that 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 we need to be a part of. Let's say that would be number two. Brian, what, what would number three be? I mean, I think that um, here in the United States, the struggle against anti-Black racism is very important and is kind of the thing that shakes everything up because of how uh, that is sort of woven into the very fabric of U.S. capitalism. And we saw that really shake the country uh, with the rebellion over the summer that's still sort of ongoing. And so I think sort of the connections between our police forces here and those um, in Israel, how um, you know, entire police stations um, send for training, technology is developed um, uh, and uh, sort of trained and practiced on the, the Palestinian people that's then used to bring back here to sort of oppress black people sort of in this country. Um, our own, uh, you know, police superintendent in Chicago, David Brown, is a graduate of sort of one of these sort of programs. And that's the case pretty much in every major um, U.S. police department. And so I think the, the way in which um, Israel settler colonialism that, um, you know, oppresses Palestinians every day is also what is the, the practice for U.S. police departments that then come back here and use to oppress and kill um, Black folks in this country. I, I want to follow up with one question, just because it is we, we start off the show and we're going to end the show with it as well, um, about organizations, institutions like Center for American Progress. Um, I, I mean, I'm not sure if you guys have a take on this, but they have cozied up. They're supposed to be this progressive uh, organization that gets hundreds of millions of dollars a year. Um, much of it is foreign, governments like UAE, uh, but also they cozy up and have invited Netanyahu to speak at their conferences. Um, and I think like, I mean, the, the, all of everything that you've laid out just seems like a logical argument probably to most Democrats, but it has been, the conversation has been stifled so much by Democratic, with the low, low Democratic Party institutions. Um, that it's really made it so hard to kind of penetrate uh, into the mainstream. And, and I mean, we start off by saying Trump created this opening, but uh, what, what, what does it mean to you that Neera Tandon or the Center for American Progress or whoever it is, these democratic institutions has completely kind of taken over the space um, in terms of, of having these conversations and, and pushing them out? Um, I, I mean, I, I don't think it's surprising at all, because as soon as you start talking about Palestine um, and, you know, and, and allowing for criticism of Israel to sort of leak in, you automatically have to face things like police brutality, things like the weapons industry, um, things like um, the indigenous struggles that are going on here in the U.S., right? The U.S. being a settler colony. And so you open this door to all of these things that uh, threaten the U.S. as it stands right now. And it's undemocratic, top-down, um, heavily militarized or increasingly militarized uh, state, um, not to mention the surveillance. 
And so I think it's, it's very strategic on the part of these establishment figures and organizations and parties to ensure that, um, that the Palestine movement doesn't get, doesn't get a say and doesn't grow and strengthen itself. Because as soon as it does, it allows all of these other movements to, uh, to do so as well. And it threatens, uh, you know, U.S. imperialism and U.S. domination globally. And, and as a result, you know, the capitalist system as it stands right now. Um, so I think it's, it's, it's going to take a lot for us to get past that because for them, it means losing everything. Um, and for us, it means liberation. And so I think it's going to be this tug of war for a long time. And right now we're, we're getting a little in. And I think we, we really need to hold on to that and, and keep pushing. It's a fascinating way of saying it. This, it. As soon as that unravels, all the other uh, issues unravel as well. Brian, what's your take? Um, I mean, I agree with what Sunea is saying. And I think it's also important to take a step um, even sort of beyond that, because, you know, the liberal think tanks and whatnot are, are going to do the game plan that Sunea laid out. And I think that, you know, that stretches very far into the Democratic Party and it reaches to the current president-elect Joe Biden. You know, he is someone who has said, you know, I'm a Zionist and 1986, he said, if there wasn't an Israel, um, I would have to make one that is the most important, um, you know, thing in the Middle East for the U.S. Um, and so he has been fairly um, consistent um, under Obama. You know, they uh, continued to, to um, give weapons to Israel as they were sort of slaughtering um, Palestinians in, uh, you know, 2014, 11 children were dying a day in the, the bombardment of Gaza, and they kept giving them munitions. Obama gave, you know, some like soft criticism, even though the money kept flowing. He was the good cop. Biden was the bad cop. He was the person who had the relationships. And so I think that the, the, the liberal think tanks are going to do their thing. But I think that the U.S. state, I think uh, Trump has taken it somewhere. I don't expect I don't expect Biden to really push very far to undo those things. He he wants the normalization with the Arab states. Um, maybe he'll do some small uh, symbolic things like restoring the, the PA offices in D.C. or sort of whatnot. So I think that there's a long road ahead. I think that the ideas have been changed by the stuff that we started the conversation with. But I think that going up against that will be going against not just you know, propaganda engines like the Center for, you know, for Progress, but also the, the, the chief executive of the U.S. state. Amazing. Um, it just it, It's an amazing time to have these conversations as we enter this new administration. And I mean, especially since this has been such a centerpiece of the Democratic Party's infrastructure. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I urge everybody to go check out uh, your new book. It comes out. Is it out officially yet or is it December? Uh, like in a week today. It's out. It came out oh, today. Oh, it's out today. I don't even know what day it is. <laughs> like December. It is December. <laughs> Palestine, a socialist introduction. Uh, it is edited by Sumeya uh, Awad and Brian Bean. Thank you guys so much for, for joining today and um, for writing this book. Go pick up the book, Haymarket Books, directly at the publisher. Red Amazon is any place that's not Amazon or some corporate out, you know, structure uh, would be the right place to go get it and um, read it, write notes, and share as much as you can and your, with your families during holiday events or whoever. You know, it's a great time. <laughs> great time to do so. Thanks for watching and listening to The Nomi Key Show. But remember to click like and subscribe on YouTube and please share on social media. If you're not already a patron, please join us for as low as $5 a month on patreon.com slash The Nomi Key Show for early and special content. That investment makes a huge difference. We are not corporate media raking in the dough. It's really you guys that are keeping us going. So please consider being a patron. And to our current patrons, thank you so much. We are incredibly grateful to you. We also now have swag. So check us out on the nomikisho.com to get your mugs, your totes, and your stickers.